Okay, that should be working. Hello everyone, my name is Frederick. Welcome to what is uh, our introductory video, Life Changing Tuition, on uh, this, the Life Changing Tuition English book, which over a few videos we're going to look at, we're going to work through together, chat about some things. Um, I would always recommend with anything like this, it's always good to have your own physical copy to look at, so it saves you pausing a video and everything like that. That's when I was at university. It was it's always so much easier when you have something to actually hold instead of having to pause and then, you know, write something down and pause and then write something down. So, you know, at request, please, you know, do ask. Um, we will be able to source a copy of the life changing tuition English book for you. Um this is the first page of it. Um and it's basically saying what is important about English, what you need to have uh, in order of pertinence or importance in order to succeed as a student studying English and uh, we have this lovely diagram here of a house and if you look at the very bottom rectangle uh, it has reading and vocabulary in it this is a foundation without that the rest of this house uh, so beautifully designed um, will not remain standing um, and you know there are quite a few things I want to say about reading I'll try and keep them brief um, but fundamentally, there was never anyone who was good at English uh, who wasn't also a good reader. And when I say good reader, I don't mean someone who is voracious. I don't mean someone who all they do is stay at home and read. Um, we're not that lonely. Right? We haven't got that much free time either. Um, a lot of reading is good, but I'm not talking about, you know, I get through a novel and then I get through another bit of fiction and then I get through another book and then I get through another novel and I get through a poetry anthology and da -da 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 -da. it's not necessarily realistic unless you want to go into you know university education or something like that all of that reading is good for many reasons that I'll go on to later but you know here you get the phrase deliberate reading in your third paragraph on this opening page of the book um, and it's a reference to vocabulary but I'd go further I'd actually use the term active reading we're looking for an intake of information when you sit down and you look at a comprehension you can't just let it you know wash over you you don't take anything in you're just you know you will drop marks because you're not properly understanding it you're not properly active in the text it's very easy for the eyes to gloss over you know i've been there late night revision you know it's um very easy to not actually take anything in because you're not focused you're not active you're not reading in a deliberate manner and my point is that it doesn't have to be just with books, um, it can be with recipes, it can be with instruction manuals, it can be with advertising on the inside of uh, tubes, or trains, uh, or on the sides of buses, it can be uh, medication booklets, it can be, it can be anything, it can be anything. I've got, uh, what have I got? I have a look I, I listen to a lot of music I've got a copy of an album here and on the inside you have a booklet um, that's also valid as a bit of reading material right um, because we can learn, learn so much from anything from anywhere uh, we learn about different structures about different styles about different means of I'm gonna this is all new to me let me try and get this can I do I can do a text box I'm gonna do it right here can I do it right there okay cool I'll make that bigger as well this is a word that I think is crucial um, when we are talking about English study I will get better at this the more videos we do, my apologies. Coherency. Coherency. The more you read, the more you understand about coherency. Um, especially if you're reading in different styles. Um, because you see how there are different ways to make sense. And there are different ways that people do make sense. Um, you learn about the ways, inversely, um, how to not make sense and how to avoid doing that have I got any other things in my notes I want to talk about on this introduction page um, yeah so when we're talking about vocabulary as well deliberate reading with vocabulary I would advise you if there are new words that you discover write them down somewhere and do come back to them you know it's not deliberate enough it's not active enough to hear them write them down and then forget about them forever because you haven't learned anything 
it, if anything, it feels like in the moment you're just trying to make me happy. You know, as a teacher, I see you writing it down. I think, oh, you're doing a good job. But if you're not actually going back reading it and learning it, you're not getting anything from that. And you know, you probably ask, well, why do I need to do that with vocabulary? You know, I, I, I speak well enough. I, I don't feel I need to know any new words. I don't want to sound, you know, overly intellectual or arrogant or anything, but it's not about that. Vocabulary is freedom. You can more adequately, more conveniently, I suppose, express your feelings, your ideas, what you are thinking in a more straightforward, clear manner. It will help you later in life. When you come to an age where it's time for job interviews or when you're talking about, you know, goodness knows what, insurance or anything like that, if you can't properly communicate to people exactly what you're thinking, exactly what you want, you're not going to get exactly what you want. This is it. So the more vocabulary that you know, uh, the better you will be at conveying things to other people. Um... There's one more thing about reading, yes. Um, the more you read now, the easier reading becomes. And it sounds obvious, but if we actually talk about it, the more you read now, the easier it becomes down the line. I, If I read a lot when I'm younger, and then I come to GCSEs, A-levels, university, or whatever, I can actually, I already know how to read actively. I already know how to read deliberately. And so in practicing that, uh, I actually, in a way, I have less work to do when I get to an older age. Um, you know, it becomes faster. I don't have to sit there and really, you know, gritting my teeth and wincing, trying to get all this information in. I know how to read actively. I know how to analyse a piece of text and pick out the bits of information that I need. I've already been there, done that. It will come in handy because, funnily enough, the older you get, the more you actually do need to read, um, whether it is further study or whether it is in a job. And, you know, the older you get, the harder texts become. If you go into certain lines of work, these aren't friendly pieces of writing. Um, they're bits of writing which are just numbers and strange vocabulary and just bullet point lists just giving you all the facts. You need to be able to look at that and quickly pick out the information. This is why we try our best to teach you now how to read you know, effectively, actively, deliberately because it will help you later on. It's not just so you can get good marks, it is so that you can get good marks but it's so it helps you as you get older. Um, right, let's let's scroll on. So here, more about reading here. We've got some ideas here about um, uh, the sort of benefits to reading. Um, some key ones for me are, I think, creativity is such an important part of life and it's a trait we shouldn't ever lose. The more you read, the more you can be creative because you're introduced to new ideas, you're introduced to new vocabulary, you're introduced to new ideas on structuring specifically and form, how to form not just creative ideas but also arguments, you know, um, you can form, you know, debating points, things that you believe in, in a more creative and perhaps persuasive manner. Um, I think the most important thing, you know, I hope you've read that list there, you know, concentration, imagination, vocabulary. Um, helping understand how people think is a really important one. You know, developing reading, uh, reading more, you see more opinions, you develop further empathy in doing so. Um, it helps us to notice key information better. Let's say, for instance, you've got a booklet on some medicine you've just had to pick up from the pharmacist. Um, if you have the ability to pick out your facts and figures quicker, it's going to be safer, isn't it? Because you get a lot of what we call jargon, a lot of medical terms that we may not understand uh, in these bits of paper. But if we have the ability to analyse them quickly and effectively, because we've read so much, because we trained ourselves to be able to do that, um, it's going to be safer for us because we actually know how to use the medication. We can see it, read through, there it is, you know, two times a day, whatever it is. It's valid for all walks of life. It's not just us getting ready for a comprehension exam. You know, this is this is, this is life. Um, but more on that, when we talk about comprehension, it's not that comprehension is a game. It's not just that we are reading to get the facts, get the marks and move on. It should never be like that. It's more so that um, it's training 
for this deliberate and active reading. You know, there are some harder questions on comprehension which actually require you to think and figure out, you know, what is the opinion of this person saying or what are they implying? What are they suggesting? It doesn't actually say that in the text. Really, if, you know, we're being honest. Sorry, I was talking for too long. I can only do 10 minutes at a time. Um, I'll spice them together. Um, if we're being honest with each other, um, you shouldn't ever, when it comes to doing comprehension, get a question wrong which asks you for an answer that it says directly in the text. A question that is as simple as, oh, I see the answer there, it says the answer there, I'll circle that one. You shouldn't ever get wrong. We should be reading in an active and deliberate way enough that those questions are really easy and really simple because, guys, they are really easy and they're really simple. It's just about seeing them. But the more reading we do, the more comprehension work we do, the easier it is to see these things faster. We don't need to search, we're less likely to miss them. Because we've practiced, we can go over there, we're more attentive, we're more focused, and we can go, oh, okay, hang on, I remember seeing that as one of the answers, and we can match them up. Um, so, here are some key techniques of reading. Have a look at all of those there. There are two I'm going to talk to you a bit about. Um, questions. You know, we must be inquisitive. We need to understand. As we're reading something, if there's not anything we don't properly get, like, you know, we need to ask someone about them. You know, or if it helps us to remember it, you know, just in your own free time, ask yourself a question about something you have read. Questions help us get to the answers. And as I've just said, they help us to understand. If we don't ask questions, we aren't active, we're passive. Um, questions show that the brains are turned on, that we're thinking. If we're not asking questions, we're, it's likely we're not learning. Questions show interest, they show activity. Um, reading many different kinds of texts, that's another one I want to talk about, because it's something I've already said, different styles are crucial. Um, they teach us how to lay out things differently, they teach us how to comprehend different things, or different narrative voices. Um, a narrative voice. Let me try this one again. A narrative voice is how we describe uh, the person that has written the text. It's the tone of the piece of writing. We learn how to write in different narrative voices by encountering more narrative voices. We learn empathy by encountering different opinions voiced through different narrative voices. And there's one more thing, um, competence. We can improve our reading competence by reading different kinds of text. Um, the more different kinds we encounter, the more familiar we become with different kinds, the less affronted, the less surprised we are by different kinds, the more competent, the more complete a reader we become. Um, have a look at this for vocabulary. These are some tips to help you build your vocabulary. The most important thing for me, we've spoken about how useful vocabulary is because it's freedom, you can express ideas better. Genuinely, do write them down and then go back to them and learn them because that's the best way to learn anything writing it down you know it's not about it's not a memory test just writing down coming back to it every now and then and then start trying to use them in your own writing don't remember them and then never use them that, that, that what's the point you've wasted your time um try and use them in your speech in your writing you will find that really is a lot better than maybe some words you were using before because these new words describe exactly what you're thinking now um it comes back to this idea of active and diligent reading. It's a quick conversation about grammar. This is just a brief explanation of what grammar is. Grammar is a what is the building blocks of language. It what makes up it's what makes up sentences. It's uh we'll get on to nouns shortly, but it's your nouns, your adjectives, your verbs, uh your adverbs, and then it's also your punctuation. Um We've got, you know, some of you guys watching this, you know, you'll be interested in creative writing stuff as well. You can have written the most expressive, the most, you know, vocabulary laden with all the figurative language in the world. You know, impressive piece of creative writing. But if your sentences have no punctuation, they just spiral off and your words are in the wrong order, 
and it's not this is another key word coherent if your writing is not coherent if it doesn't adhere if it doesn't follow grammatical practice grammatical rules it's not going to make sense um you need coherency and coherency comes from grammar if what you're saying if what you're writing doesn't make sense well there's no point starting to write it or starting to say things in the first place because people aren't going to listen to you they're not going to understand what on earth you were ever trying to tell them about um coherency if something is coherent it makes sense words are in the right order sentences are structured well um it's about making sense coherency is about making sense Nouns, we all know what a noun is. We should all know what a noun is. It says it there, nouns are naming words. They name things. Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it an animal? Um, is it something more abstract? We'll get to that in a second. We've got four kinds of nouns here. A common noun is the name of a thing. We look around ourselves. We have names for everything. This is a glass. What's it filled of? It's filled of water. We know how to name it. What else have I got on my desk? This is... It's a burnt one, but this is a match, right? We know what matches, we know what it looks like. This is a candle. We have names for these things. These are these are things, right? A proper noun is a particular thing, a thing of importance, um, like a country or a person's name or an object, like a monument. Um, these are things with names, effectively. A proper noun is, it's another way, usually, of saying names, why it has a capitalised letter. My name is Fred. It's a kind of noun, it's a proper noun, it has a capital letter. Your name will be a proper noun. The name of something in particular will have a proper noun. Have I got anything? This is my phone. Uh, it's an Android phone, an Android phone. Android is a brand, so Android will have a capital A. It's a proper noun. Uh, I live in London, which is the capital city of England. London and England will have capital letters. They are proper nouns. Collective nouns, um, it's a grouped common noun, often. Uh, not always, but, but, but often. You can have grouped proper nouns. If I was in a room with other Freds, uh, we would be Freds, you know, it would be a uh, it would be a plural, um, but we would have a capital F. Um, it doesn't always, it's not always a plural though, a collective noun. Very often you get a word for something else. You often get this with um, animals. Uh, you get a herd of animals, for instance. Uh, you might have a I'm just thinking of animal examples, to be honest. A pride of lions. You might have heard this one. A pride is in the feeling pride, but it's also a word for a group of lions. A more sinister one is a murder of crows. Murder is a noun for a collective noun for a group of crows. These ones don't have capital letters unless it is a group of things with the same name. Um, an abstract noun, and the word abstract means uh, something strange something a bit peculiar and we use the word abstract here for this kind of noun um, to describe something that isn't physical uh, something we can't see or feel or, well something we can't feel physically right uh, we can't see it we can't touch it um, uh, the example given here is is love we feel it inwardly but you can't actually touch love um, and you can't see love itself you can't see that um, so it still describes a thing but not a physical thing uh, for instance pain we know what pain feels like but if we were to say you know like point to pain it doesn't exist out there out my window it's something we feel so it's another abstract noun there are two kinds of nouns uh, not there which um, we will just I will talk about very briefly that also you should know because you might see these words come up a compound noun is a noun made up of two or more words. A very good example is cat food. It all makes one thing, more than one word that comes together to make one thing, cat food. Um, and then another one is a concrete noun. Uh, this is just something that describes a material object, a physical thing, uh, wood or steel, or I suppose the table I'm sat at at the moment is a physical thing. I'm touching it right now, I can touch it. It's there, it's physical, it's a concrete noun. Um, let's have a look at these. I'm anxious I might be reaching another 10 minute mark. Let me pause it, we'll get right back. Let's just do this very quickly. Um, so, uh, in fact, why don't we do these and then we'll have a quick look at adjectives as well. So, 
nouns. Here are some questions about nouns for you. Um, let's talk about a couple of them, and then you know, please do have a go at the rest. I'm just scanning that. Well, what is a noun? We've just spoken about it. Um, a word that expresses an action. We haven't spoken about actions. And a describing word is another kind of word completely. You probably already know what that is. There's only one option left, so we probably know what the answer to that one is. Um, select the noun. Well, vibrant. Uh, I can't point to vibrant and slowly I know what slowly looks like but again I can't point to it slowly feels like uh, C in question one a describing word I probably say something is done slowly not that uh, you know that thing is a slowly I can't do that that's a very good way of discerning that of figuring that out actually if I look at this I can say this is a glass right a glass or if it starts with a vowel I'll say an something um, if this was called a slowly it would sound quite weird for me to go look everyone I'm holding a slowly that doesn't sound right so we know that that can't be a noun because grammatically grammatically the way that words work um, that doesn't make sense so abstract nouns you got questions on abstract nouns there remember we spoke about um, uh, abstract nouns being things that aren't physical. You can't touch them and you can't see them necessarily. Um, in the options there you only have two words that are actually nouns. Large is another describing word. Close-knit is also a describing word. A family, I know what a family looks like. I can actually go and find my family right now and I can point to them. They exist. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're real. They're physical. There's another noun in there which isn't. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Collective nouns. Now, I want to um, emphasize this with collective nouns. Um, when you have a plural collective noun, um, it, it really only comes with names, uh, with, with uh, your proper nouns, your capitalized nouns. They should only be the ones that have an S on the end. It's more so your groups of animals and things that have a different word for a collection. Um, so when we look at those ones flower isn't even a collective it's just one thing feathers is a it, it's more than one feather it's a collection of feathers um but it's not a proper noun so we probably wouldn't say that that's a collective noun there's only one option left there um a group of sheep might be called it i'll leave that there um how more should I do I think we should discuss here um compound noun. compound noun we spoke about compound nouns don't get distracted with them it's when one pardon me it's when two words or more make up one noun it's uh it's cat food it's dog food it's if we look at those there I think it's quite obvious personally which one it is um but remember compound is when more than one word uh, is used to mean one thing. Um, when we get questions talking about second collective nouns or second abstract nouns, it's talking about there already being one uh, collective noun uh, that maybe then, you know, there's another in the same sentence. Um, Actually, no, excuse me, I've got that wrong. It's saying that there's already an earlier one in the same uh, question section. It's just saying that there's another one to find in this question. Um, we spoke about concrete nouns. Um, it's about something being real, something being, you know, in the physical world. Um, I'll tell you what, if we pause the video here, you pause it, try the other questions. Uh, and then play it again, and we'll go on to talk about the next section. Okay, so let's very quickly talk about adjectives. Adjectives describe nouns. Um, this is, it, it, it's, it's, you should already know this, it should all be quite straightforward stuff. It is just the words that describe a thing. This glass is green and it's reflective it's a reflective green glass it's a reflective green wide glass it describes attributes of it um, it's how we build pictures of things adjectives are really useful as a descriptive 
at all. Um, when we talk about vocabulary, very often what we're referring to about advancing the vocabulary is having a wider range of adjectives at your disposal. It's not interesting, it's not exciting, it probably doesn't do your opinion justice to say that you thought something was nice. You know, instead you want to say it was joyous, it made me feel exuberant, um, I was elated when this happened. You know, th these, are, these are better, more advanced adjectives to use. We've got two kinds of adjectives spoken about here. We've got comparative adjectives that compare to nouns. Really good example there of heavy and heavier. Um, so, if we are saying, well, okay, well, let's do this. I've got one candle here. I've got another candle here. This candle is a lighter colour than this one. Lighter than this one. Um, that is a comparative. You very often don't need to say comparative adjective, you can just say comparative. Um, superlative is when something is the best. It's the EST of something. Um, sometimes though, as it says here, um, if uh, a word in particular uh, you know, you, you will know examples like this. It's when you have a word that... Uh, I'm rambling, let me restart here. So, <laughs> where it's not always as simple as having something that is ear, lighter than something. Um, it might be that they are more something. That's also comparative. It could be more something. And something else. A superlative isn't always the EST, the EST, the, the lightest candle in the world. It might be that they are the most something. So remember that comparative, a word can end in ER, the adjective can end in ER, or it can be more than. Uh, a superlative can be EST, the best, the greatest, the lightest, the heaviest, or it can be the most heavy, the most light. Um, most and more than can often change out for those differentiating word endings for comparative and superlative adjectives. So, this is just about identifying the adjectives in the following sentences. Let's have a quick look through these. Um, feel free to pause at any point to try and figure them out. You've got a couple more on this page. Uh, it's a two-page section, this. So, um, the formidable challenges of the advanced mathematics course required diligent study. Well, you've got four options there. Formidable study, mathematics course. We've just spoken about nouns. Study, I know what study looks like. I can, I can point to someone's study and go, that is study. Mathematics is a, it, it's a subject, isn't it? It's a thing. A uh, course, in this sentence, is a mathematics course. You might even say that that's a compound noun. You could argue it because mathematics and course come together to make one noun. There's only one word left there. Formidable. I couldn't say the hello everyone. I'm currently holding a formidable. Remember that trick? It's probably that formidable is the adjective there. Um, if you look at question 2, D, painted, that's not an adjective or a noun. We're saying that the sunset painted the sky. Um, it's a bit of, and this is a word we'll come to at a later date perhaps, uh, it's a bit of personification of the sunset. The sunset is made into something human. Let me just put this here. Uh, this is when you make uh, an inanimate object sound like it's a human. You personify it. You make it do something that a human might do, for example, painting. Uh, the sunset painted the sky. Uh, but that's a verb, painted, because it's doing something. Verbs are doing words. Um, so don't get caught out by that. Curious students eagerly conducted experiments. Uh, uh, so Let's just end very briefly by talking about number 14. Now 14 has a fourth kind of word in it. Um, the dedicated volunteers tirelessly work to improve the local community. Now we've said what an adjective is. It's a word that describes a noun. It describes a thing. Um, worked is not a thing. It's not a thing. But it's being described, isn't it, by the word t 
tirelessly. Now worked, remember, I can't go look everyone, I'm holding a worked here, this is a worked, it doesn't make sense, we know it's not a noun. Um, if someone worked, they did something, it's a doing word, so that's a verb. The dedicated volunteers tirelessly worked, tirelessly, they did that verb in a kind of way. Tirelessly describes the way that they worked, it describes the way they did something. Tirelessly here, it's almost an adjective, but it describes a verb. It's an adverb. An adverb is, a, is an almost an adjective, almost an adjective that describes a doing word. Now, feel free to pause at any point in this video to uh, get those questions in. I'll give you a chance to do that. And then just to wrap up, we come down here, all the way down. I'm going to need to be much quicker than that. Uh, we can see, you can check for yourself whether you've got those answers right. So, there you go. For free to pause it there, you can see if you've got those answers correct. Um, I say that's the end of our first lesson, maybe. Uh, I'll see you again soon.